I think we can uh, start. We are, I mean, uh, really on the dot of it's 11.32, so we can open now <laughs> <Okay>. the, <laughs> the second uh, just... part of the morning. And just, me bri just uh, let me briefly introduce uh, Stefano Velotti, which is our na next speaker. And um, uh, we are now connected to another physical and digital space. We are connected with Villa Mirafiori, I think, in Rome. <laughs> Uh, where Stefano and his MA aesthetic course students are at the moment. And Stefano Velotti is a full professor of, of philosophy at La Sapienza University of Roma. He's a coordinator of the PhD program in philosophy, and as well as WASS, Scuola Superiore di Storia di Studi Avanzati Senior Fellow. He has been visiting professor at the University of Sanford and University of California, where he has also been Speroni Chair Professor for two terms and Assistant Professor at Yale University. His research has focused on the roots of modernity up to the Enlightenment, and he is interested in contemporary philosophy and art and currently working on the notion of control and on the philosophical, artistic and social problems linked to the relationship between disenchantment and re-enchantment. Please, Stefano, the Thank floor you is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this uh, general presentation, Franco. Uh, I must say that we will start uh, with a presentation and a paper uh, written by Emanuele Capozziello, who is a student of, uh, uh, an MA student, and also belongs to the uh, Scuola Superiore di Studi Avanzati uh, of the Sapienza, and who's been working on the problem of uh, creativity uh, and artificial creativity, let's say. Um, I would leave uh, uh, the floor to him, and then, uh, if there is time, as I think, uh, maybe I could uh, frame, let's say, this, uh, um, this talk within our uh, most uh, general uh, perspective on the on this on these kinds of problem uh, so emanuele capozziello uh, will uh, will start and then uh, we'll discuss it uh, so uh, please okay. <laughs> good morning everyone thank you professor for the for the introduction okay so you can all see the presentation Yes, we do, Emmanuel. So, um, in this presentation, I would like to tackle the topic of what I would call artificial creativity and try to see how this needs to be a fundamental issue. I would say a pivotal aspect in the study of the new forms of artistic, artistic expression, and especially what we, what we have been used to call, often in a debated and uh, pretty unstable way, new media arts. And uh, under this last vague and almost too inclusive label, we comprehend practices that often are referred to as computer art, generative art, AI art, and uh, many others. And it is, of course, very, very difficult to articulate a taxonomy of these um, artistic practices and uh, label them because this label necessarily has to be as transformative as the new technologies that proliferate and, uh, and evolve in our digital society. So uh, this kind of society, I will say, is AI powered. Um, artificial intelligence is a concept, but also a pretty concrete, and I would say ordinary reality that best uh, describe the essence of what we call our automatic society. And what interests me is try to capture the aesthetic and the creative potentialities of what I would call uh, new media arts within our world, which is experiencing an actual technological revolution that is led by uh, AI technologies and in particular by um, uh, the machine learning paradigm and uh, computer vision techniques, big data analytics, et cetera. 
And so I will tackle the question of artificial creativity from the perspective of the very young, but rapidly growing science of uh, uh, computational creativity. So computational creativity is a branch of artificial intelligence whose research is primarily concerned with analyzing new possible models of creativity emerging from interactions between humans and uh, new technologies. And so um, what I want to clarify immediately is that computational creativity, at least in its most uh, relevant results and uh, attempts, doesn't aim, at least in the most cases, at building something that can be, I would say, uh, naively conceived as an autonomous creative machine, because uh, this is a matter of, you know, science fiction, at least for now. And uh, maybe the ideal that inspires this field of studies is properly expressed by this quote that is taken from an, impart, an important publication in the field. And, um, and it goes like this, uh, the future of intelligence computers lies in transforming our computers from passive tools into active co-creators. Computational creativity is the field that can make this transformation a reality. So here at stake, there is the question of an artificial co-creator, and then the possibility of what I would call uh, an hybrid co-creation, namely a human-machine cooperation, which does not consider the machine as a mere instrument or as a dumb tool, because uh, um, computational creativity, maybe in a, in a more direct way than uh, other um, uh, contemporary AI researches adopts a post-instrumental, I would say, perspective on, uh, on technology. And computational creativity investigates the nature of creativity in a, in a digital, in a algorithmic, in a hyper-connected world, but without trying to reduce the new creative potential potentialities of this world to the criteria of human creativity. Rather, it tries to get a of non-emulative creativity and analyzes the possible relationships between this and the human one and the human creativity. So the question is not precisely that of a fully independent or at least descriptively isolatable machine creativity, but, but more that of a reflection on a post-anthropomorphic model of creativity. And so in other words, the occasion for a self-critique of human creativity. It is, in a, um, uh, in a sense, uh, it preserves uh, creativity as a, as a specific human mental faculty, as we will see in a bit, but it, all, but it also questions the um, privileged stance of the human so-called uh, author, in a, in a very particular way. And um, an important aspect is the one of responsibility. And let's see this definition of computational creativity that is given by two of the most prominent uh, authors, scientists in the field, Colton and Wiggins. That is, computational creativity is the philosophy, science, and engineering of computational systems, which by taking on particular responsibilities, exhibit behaviors that unbiased observers will deem to be creative. And another author, that is hours later, observes that through AI creativity, we might learn a new ethics of authorship, a co-responsibility. So what does it mean to transform our computers from passive tools into active co-creators. What does it mean for human creativity and specifically for artistic creativity to share part of the creative responsibilities with post-instrumental technologies? Now, of course, the discourse is very long and complicated, but we will try to uh, highlight some, some, basics, uh, some basic aspects of this discussion. And uh, first of all, uh, we have to explain what we mean by creativity. 
And drawing mainly upon Immanuel Kant's critique of judgment, and in particular, Emilio Garroni's reading of the text, I do not conceive creativity as a mere productive faculty or a kind of freedom or arbitrariness that gives the human being a sort of demiurgic power over natural things that puts so the human beings beyond nature, so beyond the immanent world of things. Creativity, in fact, characterizes an apparent paradox. The creative subject is at the same time a thing among the other things, and, uh, and this is the point, apparently unjustifiably capable of maintaining a distance from the order of things. So creativity is precisely this distance. And it is a reflexive, uh, reflective faculty in the sense that it determines a particular relation of the subject with air or himself rather than with other things. And why? Because this particular distance that so is not absolute but always uh, paradoxically immanent within nature is not justifiable through an empirically observable law of nature or through an a priori intellectual principle or through something like an objective principle. If we are to understand what creativity really is, we have to legitimize creativity through an aesthetic principle. So a subjective principle and not an intellectual and objective one. So the essence of creativity, we can say, and so something that precedes the actual creative behaviors and the creative products, has to be grasped in the aesthetic and so in the reflective feeling of a distance. That is the feeling of a form of, I would say, freedom. Not as we say, as we said, uh, an absolute and uh, spiritual freedom, a sort of independence from what surrounds us, but a kind of freedom that puts us in a dialectical relationships with the rules of what surrounds us, with the legality of nature, but also of, co of culture, of society, etc. And if it is true, in a sense, that creativity is always rule-based, it is also true that by the notion of creativity, we, uh, we also mean um, a rule-breaking faculty, a rules-breaking faculty. And so from here, we are in the position to approach the art of the philosophy of computational creativity. So starting precisely from these complex relationships between rules and creativity. So um, Margaret Bowden is a British cognitive scientist that in the early 90s, in particular with her book, uh, The Creative Mind, uh, articulated the essential framework that has been one of the theoretical foundations for the uh, development of the science of creativity within the artificial intelligence community. So for her, creativity is the ability to come up with ideas or artifacts that are new, surprising, and valuable. But I will uh, add also understandable. That is, in the, in the language of Bowden, familiar to the psychological, historical, cultural, conceptual spaces within which the cognitive uh, subjects always move. So creativity is way more than a simple skill of our cognitive apparatuses, because it is a faculty that totalizes our way of being, for it allows us to conceive the world that surrounds us, not as a mere homogeneous or isotropic, I would say, environment, but rather as a complex, uh, as an undetermined and always unfinished plane of heterogeneous possibilities of practicing something new, surprising, and valuable. So what is of particular interest for us in Bowden's theory of creativity is that it tries explicitly to formulate a model that, it, that is at the same time cognitive and computational. Considering already in the 90s 
the possibility of an artificial uh, computational creativity as an essential guideline for the development of AI research and uh, technologies. And she claims that in order to elaborate this theoretical framework um, that would allow us to conceive something like what we called an hybrid concept of creativity, we should distinguish between three types of creativity that corresponds at the same time to two perspectives on the structure of creativity or to three different and uh, coexisting features, but also to three ascending degrees of creativity. And so we have uh, combinational, exploratory, and uh, transformative creativity. So combinational creativity is about making unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas. And so within familiar conceptual spaces, like for example, in the case of uh, jokes or analogies or wordplay, etc. And exploratory creativity enables someone to see uh, possibilities that they hadn't glimpsed before, but still within a familiar conceptual space. And so going through familiar rules, like for example, uh, we can, keep, we can think of uh, a chess engine that surprises a, a human grandmaster with a, an almost unpredictable move. And then uh, there is the most interesting one, there is transform uh, transformative creativity, that is the rule breaking aspect of creativity, that is the creativity of, we would say, Newton, Picasso, and so uh, transformative creativity is the disposition of the, of, of the subject to change or to challenge air or is conceptual spaces and, en and eventually engender new ways of thinking or uh, new ways of behaving. So this transformative ability is precisely the operational aspect, I will say, of that distance and so that reflexivity that um, that freedom that characterizes creativity and so what Bodden wants to say is that creativity is not to be understood as an anthropomorphic faculty because at stake there is the regularity but also the precarity and the transformability of the conceptual spaces that determine us and that are counter-determined by us. So um, now that we have at least an idea of the conceptual references that are needed to outline a philosophical uh, framework of computational creativity, I want to present you with some examples of artificial creativity. So first of all, I want to briefly analyze a project that precedes of 30, maybe 40 years, the birth of a proper field of study of artificial creativity. And this project is Harold Cohen's computer program, Aron, which is, I would say, the, the first successful experiment in co-authorship by a computer artist. Bowden uh, thoroughly analyzes the epistemological and uh, informatic relevance of Aron's creativity as she defines it. Pamela McCardock wrote a wonderful book on Cohen's aesthetic and importance for the history of new media arts. And in general, there are a lot of things to say of this uh, artist slash programmer and on its uh, program that he defines uh, the, real, um, uh, the real author, the real artist, uh, defining himself uh, uh, just as a meta artist. But we want to simply highlight some aspects of this enterprise by referring to our conceptual toolbox. And so, uh, according to McCardock, Aaron is the first encounter between art and AI. But here we are, of course, talking about uh, pretty simple and unsophisticated example uh, because uh, uh, 
because you know this kind of AI of AI is precisely what in the in the technical jargon is uh, is known as symbolist AI. And so in this case, in fact, we have a, an if then structure whose hardware consists in uh, a drawing machine that is linked to uh, to a computer. And uh, so we see that uh, a robotic arm glides a pen over a paper and produces complex and I would say original uh, anthropomorphic and uh, vegetal figures. And what's interesting is the fact that the output is not pre-planned by Aaron uh, because it, according to procedural criteria, invents, we, we can say, the narrative of the figure uh, of the of the of the drawing of the figural drawing choosing the number and the kind of elements that emerge in the picture so this means that Aaron's creativity is strictly rule based but i will not say deterministic because it is forced to take uh, legal and in the sense pre-established paths but it is also true that once the program is switched on, the visual results are unpredictable. And this is, of course, mostly due to an element of numeric randomness that determines its choices, its, its choices. So even if the results could appear surprising, in particular in, in the 70s, we are not naive thinking that this should be seen as actual machine creativity. But nevertheless, Arrow's current projects should be seen, first of all, as an admirable work of artistic research, because Aaron was admittedly an experiment by Cohen, who was already a quite famous artist in England and learned how to program uh, in order to demonstrate its aesthetical theories. And uh, then Cohen surely took seriously when, back when no one would have imagined the question of post-instrumentality. So it is true that Aaron didn't exhibit reflexivity and uh, transformability as we outlined these concepts, but most surely it already reveals one fundamental aesthetical idea that is a pivotal aspect of contemporary new media art, and in particular AI art, that is the element of losing control. That is, as, as, um, as we can say in more maybe stronger words, to relinquish responsibility. So um, then I want to present another experiment of computational creativity one of the most successful uh, recently, that in this case is more interesting for the technical and algorithmic solutions than for the aesthetic value of the product. And um, so Ahmed de la Gammal and this group presented uh, an implemented um, and original version of generative adversarial networks, so uh, GANs. So this um, generative networks is a machine learning framework that is formed by two neural networks. So one generator and one discriminator. The discriminator has access to a training set of images, like for example, all the 19th century portraits in, uh, that are stored in uh, WikiArt. And then the generator tries to produce images that are um, similar to the training set ones, so to the discriminator ones, partly uh, doing this work, partly randomly, a party, uh, and partly based on a feedback from the discriminator. So the process consists in a sort of competition, we can say. So uh, the discriminator has to distinguish between the original set images and the ones that are produced by the generator. And the generator tries to mislead the discriminator. 
So making it accept its outputs as recognizable within the original set, so within the training set. So this is one of the state-of-the-art technologies within AI. So something that at least technologically should be is uh, far more uh, advanced than Aaron. But actually, um, the aesthetical and the creative, we can say, problems are the same. So um, Elagamal's creative adversarial networks, so the evolution of uh, uh, generative adversarial networks, um, are designed to avoid emulation. Because uh, in the framework that we described, so in, gener in generative adversarial networks, there is no force that pushes the generator to explore the creative space. Because the generator can simply just copy the training set, uh, so the discriminator images, and so not generating something original. So uh, based primarily on uh, the psychology of art researches, um, uh, the creative adversarial networks focus on building uh, an, an agent that tries to increase the stylistic ambiguity and deviation from style norms, while at the same time avo avoiding moving too far away from what is accepted as art. For this computational cre creativity system to work, the discriminator has to recognize the generator's outputs as art, but it should not be able to classify these, uh, these produced images within some familiar styles, like, for example, impressionism or uh, uh, cubism, etc. But here um, we face two problems that can both be found already in Aaron. So firstly, its functioning is char characterized by uh, randomness. And so uh, creative adversarial networks cannot, we can say, poetically challenge the canons of traditional art, but only can only formally elude them. And secondly, uh, these and other computational creativity or machine learning uh, technologies avoid what I would call the impact factor. So they are closed system that do not interact, interact and so confront with humans and, um, and environments. So um, a real co-creativity uh, is impossible because as, as explained by uh, Jano and his, group, and his group, without two way channels, there is no communication possible between human creator and machine co-creator because systems behave like uh, black boxes. And so they are limited to um, opaque interactions where processes and, uh, and reasoning are completely um, unknown, are completely obscure. So in the end, we can just say that randomness uh, and uh, a certain degree of formal predictability and the absence of proper communication channels with the outside world um, are the, the main problems that we can detect in uh, present day computational creativity. But what interests us, as we said at the beginning of the presentation, is not just the working of machines in themselves, because a discourse on, on, it, on their limits and potentialities that is, that is necessary, of course, to comprehend the present world as meaning only if it considers the question of co-creativity and so of co-responsibility and so the, um, the transformations in the, relationship, in the relationships of creative control made possible by state-of-the-art technologies. And so, and here is precisely what um, where we should detect uh, a double bind that connects art and technology. 
we saw that creativity is not a mere skill, is, uh, is not mere problem solving, but rather a problem finding faculty that establishes a complex uh, dialectic process between some kind of, you can say spiritual, but still natural, immanent freedom and the rules of what surrounds us. So creativity is a problem finding and not a problem solving uh, structure because it's let, it lets coexist problematically and so not pacifically a rule-based dimension and a rule-breaking one. And if we agree that, as claimed by philosopher Albanoi, art makes us aware of what in the, normal, in the normal life we do and experience spontaneously, and so seeing, moving, for example, so that art is the perversion of technology, precisely because it produces uh, strange and uh, useless tools that are, uh, we can say, only useful to defunctionalize defun and so to make, make sense of those tools, behaviors, habits that characterize our life spontaneously. So if we conceive art as what allows us to stop and reflexively understand what we have been doing, living and thinking uh, uh, spontaneously, then how should we address creativity and so our ambiguous problem finding disposition in relation to our world? That is, that is among the other things, a uh, digital world, so uh, an AI powered world. New media arts uh, in all their complexities, so AI art, generative art, VR art, etc., needs to have the courage to tackle artificial creativity in the sense that we described this concept. And we already have proof of the fact that if we consider the question of what we would call uh, the colonization of, a of AI technologies, New media art helps us see the technology that surrounds us. And so AI helps us see the AIs that surround us. And the fact that, uh, that, that we have to understand is that we do not live, uh, we, can, we can say, uh, in a, in a, really in a digital world, but already in a post-digital world, as claimed by artist uh, Maurizio Bolognini. Because once digital technologies are so pervasive, artists don't need to be directly interested in them, don't need to be, uh, we can say, thematically interested in the, in the medium, in the media, but the artists just need to learn to handle the fact that, crea that creative potentials are distributed also in a, in a digital and, uh, we can say, computational uh, unconscious. So let's, let's take just as an example, uh, the artist Trevor Paglen, whose interest in digital control and surveillance through big data and uh, AI technologies leads him to unveil the so-called uh, invisible images within uh, the artificial mind, we can say, of a machine learning software, uh, software which processes sets of images that are labeled with uh, a particular word. So in this case that we see in the image is the word vampire. And then um, Paglen, uh, under the command of Paglen, the software is forced to show a synthetic image so that the artist lets us visualize the logics and the visual stereotypes behind the machines working. So from an invisible images, uh, uh, from an invisible image to a synthetic image. But we can also use the example of Yan Cheng, sorry for the typo, is without a G. And uh, so Yan Cheng, who produces digital simulations 
in which he explores the ability of computational agents that are meticulously programmed by the artists in their uh, singular and uh, specific character and habits, and then are left to interact with the other agents, producing unpredict unpredictable pseudo-social dynamics and uh, behavioral results. And as the last example of a visionary artist who is able to help us visualize the meaning and the structures within and uh, behind the new media and the technologies, we can refer to John Raffman and in particular to his project in which he captures screenshots from Google Street View, which reveal uh, humanity that is not just the reproduction of the real one, but a humanity, a reality as it is perceived by, we can say, the eyes of the machine. And so conforming to uh, the purposes and the coordinates that are developed by uh, the Google machine, just starting from the, the raw material world, we can say. So uh, John Raffman's work is then a, a good way to conclude this presentation, because it is able to show us that uh, new media arts uh, needs to guide us seeing what new technologies see. And this is possible only conceiving our creativity as questioned by the intervention of new agents that, at least for now, do not threaten the exclusivity of our properly said creative freedom, but they introduce new logics of distribution of control and responsibility, not only in uh, artistic practices, but in general in the creative life of human beings. Thank you very much. Well, I I want to to thank you to thank Emmanuel eh, because uh, uh, he uh, touched upon many many issues that we are debating in uh, this uh, seminar uh, whose perspective is uh, exceedingly uh, wide let's say um, compared to uh, the specific object of uh, this meeting of today's meeting but maybe uh, to introduce uh, uh, this uh, framework within which uh, uh, these, uh, this kind of research is meaningful, at least for us, uh, from our philosophical perspective, um, and to um, tackle uh, directly the question of artistic research, which, uh, as you might have already understood, for us is not much uh, about uh, research uh, in an empirical way or in a strict, uh, strictly cognitive uh, way, uh, in meaning, but uh, uh, rather uh, it's a way of making sense of other kind of research. Uh, when uh, Emanuele was talking about uh, uh, problem finding practices, uh, this is exactly what I mean by trying to uh, make sense of uh, the way we make research in other fields, uh, uh, aiming at uh, you know knowledge in the in the proper sense of the word. Um, but why are we exploring these uh, topics? Of course, they are uh, they are interesting uh, by themselves. Let's say, uh, but the title we uh, propose today. Uh, that is uh, artistic practices and the demand of uh, uh, re-enchantment is uh, uh, the re-enchantment is a uh, is the name that some scholars uh, a lot of scholars but and not only philosophers but anthropologists artists uh, and uh, um, other scholars uh, are uh, giving to the attempt to make sense of our experience. Our uh, point of departure, of course, is the, the notion of disenchantment that was, uh, uh, as you know, was uh, uh, forged by 
Max Weber at the beginning of uh, last uh, century. Uh, and uh, we could say that uh, the way that this notion is taken today is that there is, uh, on the one hand, uh, an indifferent, deaf, mute, unarticulated world, reality, completely deprived of any specific order or values. Uh, and then there is a subjectivity that uh, is uh, torn apart by different uh, value systems. And that, uh, so that's why there is a new polytheism, to, um, to quote uh, Weber's uh, words. Uh, but these, uh, these values are not compatible they, uh, they uh, are fragmentary and our subjectivity is uh, therefore also uh, fragmentary. Uh, but let's say that the world uh, would not help us. Mm -hmm. This is also the, the picture we have, uh, from instance, from a, a famous bestseller of the 70s, written by Jacques Monod, um, Chance and Necessity, an indifferent world uh, mute, deaf, uh, that doesn't uh, tell, tell us anything. Uh, well, today, uh, some people, a lot of people, are trying to challenge this, uh, this view of a disenchanted world uh, uh, where, you know, subjects try to make sense of things uh, with uh, different, uh, let's say, resources, sometimes religious, sometimes magic, sometimes... Uh, psychological or sometimes just accepting the fact that there is no meaning in what we do unless we are very performative and we identify ourselves with our performances, let's say. So our assumption is that today we are looking for a new image of humanity. Um, you know that probably the most uh, uh, significant um, precedent is uh, the Enlightenment, where uh, philosophers, artists, uh, historians, etc., uh, tried to redefine human nature. Well, today that image is, as you know, uh, in crisis, uh, at least starting from Adorno and Horkheimer's the dialectic of Enlightenment, but even before, perhaps, um, the, uh, the, the, the values uh, uh, that, uh, let's say, the Western world uh, and the Enlightenment shared, um, um, faith in progress, economic, uh, social, uh, scientific, technological progress, uh, and the idea of uh, autonomy, of emancipation from uh, authorities, hierarchies, and traditional practices, magical practices, religious practices, uh, family hierarchies, uh, uh, tribal, ethnic, class, uh, gender uh, hierarchies are uh, questioned today. Uh, uh, and uh, the way they are questioned um, refer to an attempt to redefine our, our I mean, uh, humanities or a part of humanity um, view of itself or herself. Uh, so we are very disappointed, let's say, by ourselves, by, by what we have been calling uh, modernity, and we have good reasons uh, to be uh, disappointed. Of course, there, there, there are many positive aspects that nobody would uh, relinquish about our uh, uh, civilizations uh, about uh, the progress, etc. But on the other hand, uh, we have uh, you know new voices, fortunately, coming forward. Um, indigenous critique, uh, post-colonialism, uh, the resistance to homogenization of the planet, uh, the uh, to the impoverishment of uh, biodiversity, both natural and cultural. Uh, and of course, the climate crisis uh, uh, preluding to catastrophic uh, uh, outcomes, um, uh, nuclear threats, etc. I can name, you know, uh, a, a long list of uh, menaces and, and dangers and fears that uh, that people have. 
So uh, one reaction is uh, to to these uh, to this uh, uh, quite uh, you know bleak landscape uh, is to find ways to re-enchant the world. Mm? That is to uh, um, to reformulate or to 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 to, uh, to discharge to de refuse uh, the diagnosis offered by Max Weber, and uh, uh, first of all, giving the world, giving reality, uh, a certain autonomy. The uh, the autonomous subject, uh, that is the subject that gives rules, norms to himself or to herself is uh, yielding some of this autonomy to the real to and in fact there is a flourishing today of uh, different kinds of realisms no uh, there is a the, the most uh, astonishing one perhaps are the research in object oriented ontology or speculative realism uh, and uh, often even in uh, some uh, very popular authors uh, like Bruno Latour, um, who apparently is one of the most uh, quoted authors uh, in the last decades, um, we are not the only actors. Uh, we are uh, part of a number of actants. We are made of uh, um, different uh, heterogeneous uh, materials, let's say, that uh, uh, possess uh, uh, their own uh, way of being agents, their agency, another world that uh, has become very popular. And so we have, uh, you know, uh, new forms of uh, animism, um, new forms of uh, realism, uh, all of them aimed at giving reality more importance, more autonomy, to the point that some people say, uh, for instance, in the so-called post-critique post -critique, uh, line of thought, that we are things among things, that is uh, cancelling that distance uh, that uh, uh, Emanuele was uh, quoting, uh, referring to Kant and to Garroni's uh, um, readings of Kant, that, this, that strange distance from ourselves and from our reality where we are nevertheless immersed. So a way of being always, uh, um, let's say, uh, in, in, a, uh, in a twofold position. On the one hand, we are certainly immersed in reality and are beings among beings. And on the other hand, we know that. So uh, by knowing that we are not just immersed, even if we, uh, you know, if, even if we say that we are immersed, just saying it, it means that there is a certain distance from this immersivity. But immersivity, it's another uh, important question that has been touched upon by, uh, by uh, Emanuele, and that has to, very much to do with uh, cooperation between uh, um, digital technologies, let's call them like that, and, uh, uh, you know, analogical traditional practices. Um, there is a program, an, an ERC program, um, uh, launched by Andrea Pinotti and other um, colleagues of, uh, of mine uh, called An Iconology, that is uh, uh, the question they pose uh, they, they pose to themselves and to, to everybody is the the question that uh, the new environments, the new um, uh, ecological digital environments, uh, uh, both in the case of uh, virtual reality and uh, uh, in the case of uh, uh, augmented reality, uh, change completely our relationship with images. Um, they are different, of course, virtual reality and, uh, and uh, augmented reality. Uh, in virtual reality, uh, you are, uh, Pinotti writes, teleported away 
from your actual environment or from your own body, and you experience a distance which suddenly becomes a close presence, while uh, in the augmented reality, uh, uh, you, you keep perceiving your present world, but at the same time, 3D objects from another space-time break into your environment, making the, themselves present and near. And uh, uh, correctly, uh, this group of people highlight that uh, there are at least uh, uh, three features common to uh, both uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. The first, uh, the first one is unframedness. That is, uh, we are usually, um, uh, let's say, used to, uh, to, to be in front of a picture, in front of an image, uh, no matter how big it is, how large it is, like in, uh, in a movie theater, for instance, but there is always a frame. And now you are uh, instead within the image. So there is no, uh, no frame um, and uh, <clears throat> you are in, 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 there is no way to be off image. You are in another um, um, ecosystem, let's say. And the second, the second pro property is uh, presentness, that is, uh, um, there is no uh, um, the distances in in uh, in, uh, in in terms of time and space are completely altered. Um, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm completely inside the image, immersed, and uh, aff affordances and agencies are altered. And uh, the the third one is. Um, immediacy, or at least uh, phenomenologically speaking, immediacy. That is the effect of immediacy. But we know, for instance, from Grusin and Bolton, that uh, uh, this immediacy is reached uh, through a very complicated set of mediations. And that's, uh, that's why uh, Trevor Piglin, uh, uh, artistic research, mm -hmm is I think so significant because it's a counter movement to uh, reveal, to unveil all the mediations that uh, are taken more and more uh, as a, you know, natural, the magic of presence. Well, the, the magic of presence, uh, um, you know, uh, leads us back to the question of uh, enchantment or re-enchantment. Why there is this, this need of immersivity? Uh, there is no uh, press uh, release today uh, that does not mention that the work is immersive, uh, that you will be uh, completely taken or immersed by the work. Um, so it's a promise of... Uh, uh, no distancing yourself from it. Um, in the worst cases, uh, it's the promise of uh, no need of reflection, no need of, uh, of thought, but just uh, you will be pampered, you will be entertained, you will be taken into another world. Uh, the, the first question that uh, any per person should ask the, uh, you know, oneself is, uh, Aren't we already always immersed in our experience? Why do we need to be immersed in another kind of experience? Mm -hmm. um, so probably it's a compensated, compensated, as that's an experience, okay? And uh, a compensation of the fact that we feel ourselves to be alienated from our world, not immersed, not really sharing uh, the same world and uh, uh, we are able uh, instead of feeling that re-enchantment within the bubble of a, of a virtual reality experience um, that uh, comfort us. Um, so uh, the, the question of uh, uh, 
re of uh, relinquishing your control uh, when uh, we, which is uh, you know related uh, uh, to immersivity and the degree of interaction that is allowed um, within uh, these frameworks uh, within uh, virtual reality and augmented reality is also another question. Uh, you know, how, what degree of uh, contingency are you able to uh, uh, tackle? Uh, what, what degree of contingency is allowed by these systems? I mean, they may, they, they may be very complex, but are they channeling uh, the, the, the wealth, the, the richness uh, of uh, real contingency and reducing it that is already, you know, filtering reality or are they really augmenting reality? That is, do they allow more information, more uh, reality to be interpreted and reworked, elaborated creatively or not, or are they reducing this amount of reality by by channeling it into some, let's say, uh, um, extended uh, uh, sense, uh, extended sense like uh, you know visual sense, touching, etc. Um, so uh, that would be already a selection of uh, of what we can. Uh, do of the affordances offered by uh, these uh, uh, these uh, these ecosystems. But the question of I want to go back uh, to the question of uh, of control that uh, uh, Emanuele just mentioned, which is uh, I think uh, um, a very important one. Because today, uh, because, well, let's say something very, uh, in a very um, so uh, non-justified way, but I think we, it, which can be justified, uh, artistic creativity um, is uh, rule-based, uh, it's rule-governed, and, and, and at the same time is rule-changing. Uh, I don't know whether rule breaking, but rule changing, making up new rules or establishing within a certain concrete singular object, event, performance, a new norm. And, uh, um, and uh, this happens uh, if there is a, let's say, uh, a balanced mixture of uh, what you control and what you cannot control, uh, what emerges through your control, but not uh, thanks to it, okay, not thanks to it. So it emerges through your technical abilities, through uh, the technical extensions of yourself to the technical tools, if you want, uh, but at the same time should not be just an illustration of them, otherwise it's a failure. It's boring. And uh, I think that today what we uh, are witnessing is a polarization between these two uh, necessary poles, uh, the pole of uh, control and the pole of uh, uh, losing control. And uh, uh, this uh, swing of control, it's not, uh, it's not working anymore. On the one hand, we are, uh, you know, very much controlled, very much in control of ourselves, surveillance, self-control, uh, digitalization of ourself, a digitalized self like a double in the digital space. And, uh, um, and on the other hand, uh, we try to, or we undergo, let's say, an experience of uh, loss of control. We have the uh, the, the, the impression that we do not control anything, that we are not empowered, that we, there is nothing we can do, uh, and that uh, other people or other things control our uh, lives, and uh, this is the cause of, uh, of uh, suffering, of course. Well, uh, I think that uh, 
to go back to the question of reenchantment and of the new importance given to uh, reality in its autonomy, um, it's a way of uh, yielding control to something else. Mm? We see many, many uh, works of art today that just trigger certain processes, but that try uh, uh, as much as possible not to intervene, not to interfere in these processes. Uh, processes that can be both uh, strictly technological processes or natural processes. Uh, molds, uh, vegetation, uh, um, natural growth, let's say. Sometimes, of course, there is a, a hybridization of the two of the two uh, kind of processes, but let's say that they share this common desire uh, to not leave any human footprint, or at least the, the minimal footprint on what uh, results out of them. And uh, so, in a way, I am tempted to say that uh, since we uh, feel or we are fear that uh, we, we will be, as a species, uh, wiped out of uh, uh, the Earth crust, uh, we are anticipating this condition as a sort of uh, homeopathic cure. I don't know, uh, to imagine and to realize a world uh, without us as a, uh, unfortunately, as a consolation for uh, what we feel that uh, uh, went wrong with uh, the mastering of nature that was the the uh, the hope of uh, of modernity so this is the the you know one could could go on and on and i i, I realize that these are very general statements that uh, um, uh, would need uh, you know more uh, more details, uh, but uh, let me. I don't know whether you visited. Uh, well, people not in Rome, of course, uh, could not do that. But uh, uh, there is this um, uh, important exhibition at the Pala Expo in Rome, uh, dedicated to art and, and science, called uh, T Zero, and uh, uh, there are there are sections of the exhibitions where. Uh, we find exactly this, works that uh, try to avoid as much as possible any kind of control from uh, human beings, mm? but to live literally autonomy mm, to other processes uh, as, much as, as, as long as they are not human. Mm? Uh, of course, uh, there is no way to to cancel ourselves from uh, uh, from these processes because uh, we are triggering them and just uh, we are controlling that they lose that they keep losing control from us. That's our uh, let's say our our uh, contribution to uh, to these uh, um, to these processes. But I could quote. Uh, you know many many uh, works uh, uh, that uh, uh, or uh, entire manifestation exhibitions biennials uh, that were uh, dedicated to this kind of uh, of uh, uh, relinquishing responsibilities or core responsibilities and trying to leave uh, the world let's say to non-human um beings uh, the the 2020 guangzhou residency residency exhibition biophilia a handful of earth uh, for instance uh, and um, uh, is the it is written in the uh, press release it, uh, is the hope for the wounded lives of earth that have been under the threat of the global pandemic and environmental disaster disasters caused by human activities, human are moving forwards towards a new change. Human nature of love of life that stems from the sense of awe in the diversity of lives latent in a handful of earth 
will fill in positive will fill in positive energy that can transform the world. Well, I'm not sure about it, but the, but the Biennale in uh, Varsavia, Warsaw, Florophilia, Revolution of Plants, or Anselm Franke's project on animism, supported by, for instance, Bruno Latour, um, or uh, uh, the, the, the Center for Art and Media in Karlsruhe, um, uh, Peter Weibel and uh, Bruno Latour, uh, the curator of a uh, of, uh, uh, of many uh, exhibitions, uh, all of them aimed at this kind of, uh, of processes, aimed to tackle uh, the problem of uh, uh, reorient ourselves in this turbulent time. Um, I could quote uh, a, a good artist, an Italian one, Emilio Fantin, who exhibited uh, uh, a number of work called uh, Dreams of Trees. Mm? Uh, and so while, uh, you know, Paglen is trying to capture, let's say, the way machine dreams, uh, Fantine is trying to capture the way trees uh, dreams. Our dreams are out of the picture, let's say. Um, well, I could quote many, many, many others, but uh, one last uh, symptom that I found uh, uh, of this phenomenon is, uh, uh, you know, Hal Foster, one of the most uh, uh, well-known uh, American um, uh, art uh, critics, uh, who in uh, one of his uh, uh, 2020 article, I think on the New York Review of Books, uh, wrote that, uh, um, uh, mentioned Kanta Meyasu, so that is a philosopher who is trying to uh, free uh, the real from a correlation with us. It's called the anti-correlationist uh, uh, philosophy, let's say, and uh, uh, to capture things in themselves, uh, uh, like to capture the real without uh, you know, to relate, it's a paradoxical move to relate to the real without the, our relation to it. Mm -hmm. And let emerge uh, things that are out of our control, uh, but uh, uh, which give, would give the world, the real, uh, uh, a meaning that the disenchantment uh, uh, um, cancelled uh, um, in the last uh, uh, centuries. So this is, you know, the general perspective within which uh, Emanuele's beautiful uh, talk uh, find uh, partially, at least, uh, its place and, and the reason why we are trying to explore these, uh, these uh, difficult uh, areas of artistic research. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. really very much, uh, Stefano and Manuela. It was really uh, uh, a very vast and very um, deep, um, uh, let's say, journey. And there were there are some, I think, pivotal uh, issues there, uh, not only for philosophy but of course for uh, arts. And uh, I, if I can add a, a little. A, microscopic crumble also to performing arts. There are all these, uh, many of these points that you, um, um, for instance, the, the, the key unframedness, presentness and immediacy, um, I think are uh, central also for the performative uh, art in this moment. So, but um, let's see if someone has to, uh, has a question for Stefano or for Emanuele, which I thank uh, again for their presentations. Uh, if someone wants to ask something to um, these, uh, and it, also I found fascinating that. Uh, uh, he, he Sorry, you're not for. Yeah, you know, just a just a little thing. I just found fascinating that uh, we couldn't see Stefano. <laughs> so this is. A... Uh, can I ask? Uh, I have a data question, very general. No, because I follow the 
the paper uh, by Emanuele, uh, just about uh, two concepts uh, are a resignation of the thought of Kant and Garroni. You know? uh, Kant about uh, the distance, creativity, uh, making art, uh, and the aesthetic judgment uh, needs a, a distance from the object. And the other concept by Garone, if I remember well, was the intentionality. Uh, making art, creativity needs an intention, an intentional gesture. So I cannot find this intentionality in a machine because the machine is, however, uh, is an outcome of the human being because it's programmed is instructed. So just this, this question. Uh, also, in a more general, uh, um, can I say, background, where art and technology are constantly in relationship. No? Mm, these things are very old because during the 50s, uh, emerged a debate about uh, when cybernetic, no? it seemed the, the new future of the world of the human being, art followed it. We can remember the experiences of uh, Arte Programmata or in Italy, but also in the European context. There are other experiences. I can remember also, for example, maybe the first uh, uh, experience uh, where a poet instructed uh, an IBM computer, Nanni Balestrini, now with tape mark the second. Um, so, uh, all things for new media, <laughs> we cannot resume. No, but just the question is about the intentionality. How this uh, reality between artist and machine can realize, uh, can realize, yes. Where is the intention of the machine? Okay, thank you for the, for the question. Well, I think that, okay, first of all, uh, of course, I do not, I'm not trying to read Garoni through artificial intelligence. So mine is not a, an orthodox perspective on Garoni's text, but I just try to uh, extract some concepts from, from it. So, um, yeah, this question of intentionality maybe is, well, of course, in the philosophical jargon, intentionality is being directed toward an object. While in my, you know, in my reading of computational creativity and then of Garoni, the problem is more that of a relationship between the subject and itself. Okay, so uh, the, the problem is that of a, um, Creative uh, creativity, uh, we can understand it as a, something that a faculty, of course, that it uh, is determined by a relation within the self. So the question of the world outside is not something that is secondary, of course, but it's something that is not directly implicated in this, uh, you know, transcendental discourse on what uh, allows from a you know, uh, predisposition point of view to be creative. So in my opinion, uh, creativity, uh, not in my opinion, of course, but in, in Garonis, uh, we have to understand uh, creativity as something that is not, um, first of all, a question of uh, creative products, and but also of creative behaviors, but first of all, a transcendental discourse uh, on the, you know, so intentionality is something that, in my opinion, comes later for the for the question of computational creativity, because the real problem of, you know, the not just of computational creativity, but in general of artificial intelligence, is that the artificial intelligence research tries, first of all, to uh, you know, this is, of course, a traditional problem uh, that we are already found in the, in the 70s. So to build uh, particular um, fields, particular domains of behavior, like, for example, playing chess or, uh, 
also uh, walking in the case of robotics and stuff like this. So uh, we have to learn, uh, we have to teach machines how to walk, how to, uh, how to you know, uh, play chess, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this is the problem. Uh, the problem is the fact that the uh, aesthetic question in, in some sense, so the transcendental questions is, uh, is not considered. So uh, it is as if we try to achieve intelligence or creativity or uh, intentionality as something that is just, uh, you know, an interaction between uh, a subject and an object, but without considering the, you know, the internal issue of, of the subject. So it, in my, my interest in Garoni for this, uh, you know, this course of computational creativity is precisely on this fact. So that uh, Garoni's perspective on, on creativity allows us to, uh, you know, tackle the problem of creativity and so of computational creativity from an, an a strictly aesthetical point of view. So in some sense, subjective. May, may I add something? Uh, to this question and on the other hand uh, pose a question to to you uh, um, uh, to your presentation uh, that i uh, tried to follow before but then i had to leave it but first of all the question of intentionality uh, the the uh, the examples i gave and some of the examples uh, emanuele gave uh, are attempts to circumvent or to bypass intentionality through the use of a machine or through the natural processes, so-called, okay? Because uh, uh, nobody, no artist, I think, uh, wants just to illustrate an idea that is to give an example of an idea or what he uh, thinks, because otherwise the work is useless, okay? Because you could give just the idea and uh, explain it uh, verbally or, or graphically, but with no work. Um, so, in a way, uh, we have uh, always a paradoxical uh, um, process that is, uh, uh, you cannot intentionally bypass intentionality. So, you, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, in a way, it's a, an essential byproduct that you have to find indirect ways to produce. Uh, so, for instance, you concentrate on certain on a certain task and uh, a, a technical one or a, um, uh, you know a foreseeable one, and then you hope that from this concentration something else comes out that you were not able to foresee. So that's why there is a fascination with machines and uh, the co-creation because there is something added that you could not uh, uh, foresee or determine. Uh, on the other hand, and this is also a question uh, well, related to your question, and uh, uh, it's a question to you, let's say, um, in the, the conceptual maps that you um, presented before, uh, the movement is from uh, you know, general concepts, then more and more specific concepts, uh, to the bottom of an example, of a concrete example. That is, uh, it's a way of reasoning that is uh, taxonomic or classificatory. That is, you have, uh, you know, uh, classes of examples that uh, apply or that are instances of uh, a general concepts that have been specified uh, uh, more and more. While uh, the, mm, the approach to creativity uh, that stems from, from Kant is the, exactly the opposite. That is, uh, we start from an example that is not a member of a class, of a concept that is already available, but it is, it is an example that uh, uh, instantiates a rule that is unknown, uh, that is... Uh, uh, a rule that cannot be made explicit and so that cannot be uh, you know inserted in an algorithm for example and then you have to figure it out starting from that example it's the difference that there is between you know 
the concept of a of a of an animal then uh, it's a feline it's a cat this is a, a cat mm? this is the example of a cat and this is very uh, you know easy and uh, a, a more or less easy you can you can find some features of all cats that are essential etc cetera, etc cetera, and, and build a class but the opposite would be um, i take a you know a, a, a a classic uh, uh, example, <laughs> uh, the Imitatio Christi in the Middle Ages. No, uh, you don't have the classes of Christs. Uh, you don't have a general concepts and then examples of Christs. Uh, but you have a, a single person, Christ, that should be imitated. But nobody could list all the features of Christ. Mm? Uh, it's uh, it's a concrete being, a, a man, uh, and uh, uh, which engender, uh, engenders a number of uh, imitations, let's say, of emulations, if you want, or uh, um, uh, because uh, he is supposed to have established a new norm, a new rule of life, a new a, a rule that cannot really be stated. Hmm? Because otherwise it would be, you know, quite uh, quite simple to 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 follow the imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ. Uh, this is just uh, an approximation, okay? Because a work of art, it's not exactly like Christ. But uh, uh, in a way, uh, um, I th I hope that it clarifies the the idea that first come the work, and then so, so first come the particular, the singular. And then from them stands possibly other rules, not the other way around. Uh, thank you, Stefan. I think that this question vo was for Matteo uh, and not for Marco because you re refer to the mind map that uh, yes, Matteo sorry, has. Sorry. So it's fine, fine. Well, you know, when I showed the concept maps, there were there is an important aspect which is uh, hyper, um, hyperlinks so i mean the possibility to connect things that were not connected before so with hyperlinks or links it is possible to connect things which are in different fields so it is unforeseeable the possibility to connect different things so i i, I I see what you said. I, I, I know what, what, what you said. I understand what you said, but the hierarchical position doesn't prevent people from creating a link from different uh, ties, different concepts in different maps. So it is impossible to create these relationships. Concept maps enable people to create uh, uh, to structure their knowledge, at least at, the, at that moment, in those moment, it doesn't prevent you to create new things, creating, uh, linking things that weren't linked before. Uh, Matteo, uh, maybe I, I can add some, uh, another comment from the uh, AI perspective. Um, as we, I mean, Matteo showed you a, a classical example taken from book. It was uh, just, it is not a, definitely to represent our approach of representing knowledge for creativity. Um, we use um, concept maps in, uh, in a very flexible way, just as an iconic way of representing a reasoning and knowledge. You may think of concept graph or SOA or whatever kinds of things very, very much unstructured. Um, the only things that we want to achieve is the reflect uh, to uh, switch on the reflective behavior. And we did, for example, just to be very concrete, very on the practical side, we did example experiments with uh, Alessandra. <laughs> uh, we asked them to try to write concept maps on new book. And when they went out with completely different arrangements, totally unstructured, uh, with mixed languages, uh, where, you know, the interpretation, the early interpretation, were very singular, didn't match in any in any way. And this is the problem we want to, to follow 
just to understand where we can find something operation from the operational point of view and on the company side is something that can be drive us towards a most mostly structured way of and uh, let's say uh, eliciting in a certain way knowledge in a st more, more structured way but this is a, a very complex 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 aspect that we will maybe dig dig digging more uh, later on uh, I want just to comfort you that we don't have hierarchical taxonomic thinking at all. <laughs> totally blind. This is just one example of the many possible. And uh, possibly, possibly, just to last word, possibly uh, one of our research topic is how to structure or arrange uh, the knowledge or what we are doing in a uh, arrange the knowledge. But I think on the on the machine side, uh, on the AI. Uh, um, that you mentioned before, uh, exploratory AI in a sense, that you mentioned before, how to structure knowledge that the machine can uh, explain and uh, let's say exemplify uh, in a more, you know, frequent, proficient way for creativity to come on. But I mean, we can continue this debate later on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, I, in fact, I I, uh, I know that uh, the learning machine cannot be, for instance, taxonomic. Of course, it's. Uh, but I would be glad if you could, uh, let's say, uh, give us some tools uh, for philosophers. That is, uh, <laughs> people <laughs> who try to understand what's going on, and. Uh, I think uh, Emmanuel is making uh, big efforts, uh, 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 bigger than mine. But uh, if you have, you know, uh, an article or a book that you think it's uh, enlightening from this point of view, beyond the uh, the, the mindless enthusiasts or the apocalyptic uh, writers, that would be great. Perhaps an article uh, of yourself by yourself <laughs> that would help. Could be nice. Mm -hmm. well, let's try. But we have in a very, very first step to the, uh, at the present, and the very first step is to gather knowledge, which is uh, not as easy as you may imagine. Um, knowledge on a, on a common framework and being able to compare or to try to understand where it can be compared in any way. So, uh, that there is a very brittle balance between uh, implementing tools that not restrict or draw con constraints and user too much to on a on a well on a schema and uh, providing at the end a representation formulas that allows us to compare to different teachers, for example, that implement things in a certain way. This is a huge uh, research question, a deep one, the one I'm working on. And this is a very big experiment on that side, on the way. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I think it would be also very interesting to, uh, let's say, make this uh, link that we um, established today stronger in the future. So uh, if uh, to have the Emanuele contacts and uh, uh, stay in touch with him so that we can uh, open up our research and tackle other fields, which I think is always 